Uh, I'm David Smalen. I'm drummer with the Cohen Brothers currently. What's right. that? Uh, I grew up in a house where my parents were interested in music, so it was Rolling Stones. I had Rolling Stones and Beatles all over the house. It was that sort of era. T-Rex. I wasn't a, I wasn't a glam rocker at all, but I remember T-Rex. The first single I bought was uh, Ride a White Swan. And strangely, I wasn't a huge T-Rex fan, but the first album was Electric Warrior. And right. I remember buying it from HMV in Birmingham. With the poster? No. Yeah. Was there a poster? Yeah, there was a sticker and a poster. You're talking to a record collector here. No, didn't get that. <laughs> didn't get that. But it was um, it was trips into Birmingham then uh, to the old Virgin Records and sitting down in those uh, aircraft seats with the uh, the headphones and listening to. Um, I remember going in once asking them what the heaviest heaviest band they got was, and it was Mountain. And I sat right. there for an afternoon listening to uh, one side, I think, of uh, Flowers of Evil. Uh, Nantucket Sleigh Ride. Yeah. I, was in a, uh, I, I was in the heavy metal association at, at school because it got me out of playing sports um, and I was always surrounded by friends who were into music. It's, it's been a constant thing you know, in, in, in my life really from quite an early stage. And when you mentioned those early Beatles and Stones records, was there a particular album that you remember from that time or particular singles that were... The, 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 first, the first album that I remember really connecting with was Help. Which, right. uh, which is still one of my fa it's still my favourite Beatles album. And it's still one of my favourite albums, and I think part of it was it was the the appeal to girls that it was it, a lot of the songs. I mean, it was quite early days in music, and a lot of the songs in there were appeals to girls, or they were apologising to girls. And of course, at, the, at that age, mm. girls were quite a mystery to me. I was going to an all boys school. Uh, and I, I was quite intrigued by the sort of the romantic angle of things, which wasn't something I had any experience of at all at the time. Right, the and, what, and what Doobie Brothers albums were you playing at that point? Because I, I love Stampede and What Were Once Vices and yeah, things like that. Yeah, there were there were two that I remember. One of them had uh, it was a picture of the, uh, the the two drummers. It was like a live picture of the two drummers. That, um, that's What Were Once Vices. Right, okay, that one. I now have it. Right, and there's another <laughs> one where there's a picture of a, hi a highway uh, bridge that's, that's just um, Captain and Captain, Me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it was all that, and yeah. it was that, it was that, and that's what made me um, first aware of that, that sort of West Coast feel yeah. where you know you can get into a groove, it's quite funky, and people start tapping along. And as I say, that was my first sort of introduction to that sort of West Coast American thing, which then led on to um, Little Feet right. and Steely Dan. Uh, I joined, uh, Raw Deal morphed into a band called La Trek. When Julian Crook joined, and Julian's in the Cohen Brothers and with me to this day. What sort of eight, uh, year are we in now, then? Uh, well, I was uh, mid seventies. Uh, I'm I'm not very really good at. Uh, we can do the maths here because yeah. I'm fifty five now, uh, and I would have been about I'm 51, eighteen. So. Right, okay, <laughs> I would have been eighteen and nineteen then You're when right. we started doing that. So we're looking sort of thirty thirty years ago. Yeah. Just when I first heard it. What appealed to me was that they, 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 um, it's what they were bringing into the music. They, they'd obviously, they were passionate about what they were doing. They, they, they got their roots in jazz and blues, but there was gospel and there was soul. And they were, it was the attention to detail that they had. Um, everything they did was, was, you know, they were trying to achieve the perfect song. Um, and they've got a tremendous hit rate as far as that, that goes. Yeah. I can see why some people would feel that Steely Dan were a little bit too polished perhaps and, and you know lacking in some soul but uh, the, the early stuff I, I just connected with straight away but by the time we got to uh, Asia and, and Gaucho I mean that was just sublime it, it's still in, in my opinion some of the best music that's ever been recorded yeah. to achieve. Uh, little Feet slightly different they'd, they'd still got that sort of west coast they, it was the funk it was you know they were a very groovy band uh, they brought in a bit of less of the Tex-Mex thing, so there were interesting influences that they brought in. Lowell George. Lowell George, yeah, and Richie, Richie, um, Richie, Richie Haywood, absolutely phenomenal drummer. And again, it was you when heard it, there was a sort of you know there was a thing going, and you start you start doing that. I was talking to somebody whose son was in a band, and um, I went to see them, and they said, "What did you think?" And I said, "He, he really needs to concentrate on the groove." And he said, well, "What's the groove?" And I said, it's, just, "It's the thing that makes you do that when you're listening to it. It's the thing that makes." And the groove is absolutely the most important thing. Whenever I hear anything, you've got to have that thing that makes you want to tap, or you know. So you never got into the more avant-garde stuff that was connected with Little Feet and things because. That is almost anti proof isn't it? Because Little Feet came from yep. the Mothers of Invention yep. and things. No, so. no Zappa and, and the Mothers couldn't get into that at no, all. I went. To, I, I had a break in in playing. Um, I played from my early teens up until my late twenties, when when I started a family and uh, sort of I lost track of things. 
and it was all about the music, but I wasn't particularly, I couldn't at the time have told you who played, who, who played drums on Asia, which, which is a dreadful thing to admit. I'm, I was aware of, of Bonham, of course, um, and um, Carl Palmer, you know, to, uh, listening to prog, it was those sorts of And they of were guys. all gods of drums. That but they they were, <laughs> but, but the, 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 a lot of them were, were so much more advanced than I was that, you know, I just lost interest really you know it, it's like it's, it's, it's like looking at somebody who is so much better than you're ever going to be and uh, and looking at them and wondering how they do what they're doing you know I, it, it lost it for me sound. Um, all of the 80s the, the sound of that that started with lindrums mm -hmm. and then became that massive gated sound of you know compressed drums um, I remember when when uh, the, the band I was in at the time folded and um, Julian Crook had bought a drum machine and he'd said come round, see, have a play with it, see if you can get it to work. And by the time I got round there, he'd managed to program it to play things much better than I could have played <laughs> at the time. Uh, and, and that was quite a depressing sort of moment. Uh, and that coincided with that whole movement towards drum machines. Um, uh, so I, I wasn't desperately interested in much of the music that was going on in the 80s. I did audition for a fledgling Duran Duran without knowing who they were um, and, uh, and turned them down. I think uh, we were quite sort of patronising and rather condescending at the time but um, oh, yeah. I'd moved down to Pershaw from Birmingham and uh, I'd got the, the boys were really very young and um, found some guys in the village that I live in now who had all played guitar since they'd been at school and we got together to play for a friend's 40th uh, and I bought a drum kit after 10 years of not having had one um, and we played covers we played the local school things the parent PTA do's um, and I really enjoyed playing I really enjoyed playing and I started taking lessons which is something I'd never done before um, and that really just just made a huge difference uh, I found a really good drum teacher in Birmingham called Tim Bowes and I go up to see him on, on Fridays and we we'd often just sit and talk about music we play for a bit we would talk about music and he he would talk about Miles Davis and have you heard Kind of Blue? Have you listened to Witch's Brew? Uh, Bitch's Brew, yeah, sorry. Bitch's yeah. Brew. And, and I, oh, no, I hadn't. And um, we, we'd play things and he'd say, this is linear drumming. If you listen to David Garibaldi, Tower of Power, you know, listen, and, and I'd, I'd listen, he, he'd recommend things. I'd go away and listen to it. And suddenly, my musical horizons just expanded. You know, quite late in life, I was, I was into my 40s then. Um, but I, I, was, I was just falling in love with music all over again. So uh, it was uh, a bit of jazz. I'm not, a, I'm not tremendously sold on jazz, but I do appreciate the, you know, the likes of Miles Davis particularly. The fact that he was such a trendsetter throughout his life. He spotted things, he, he nurtured young musicians, he brought people on board, and his career evolved and evolved and evolved. So we start off you know, right back in the, trad, you know, the traditional jazz, ending up with Bitches Brew and then getting into hip-hop and stuff. Uh, all the time bringing the right people on board, spotting who were the movers and shakers. Just just fantastic. So, And uh, then I moved on to um, another drum teacher called Andy Edwards who had played with uh, Robert Plant. Yeah. And with, um, with, with Andy, um, again, we spoke a lot of the psychology of drumming. You know, why is it I can't do this and how do we do this? And Andy, we'd spend just time talking about, you know, I can, I'm not a great, I'm not a very fancy player. I don't play a lot of fills. And one of the reasons I don't play a lot of fills is, is lack of confidence. You know, you've got to learn playing drums or playing a musical instrument it's like it's like learning any other motor movement it's like learning to walk and after a while you walk without thinking about I'm going to put my feet in front of each other and it's the same with drumming if you learn things and, and, you, and they, they become part of your of your, your, your psyche it's much more relaxing you, you can then throw a fill in without thinking I'm going to do one two over here and then end up over here you just do it but it's all about that learning process and, and so let's come up to the present day then, what are you currently doing, what's going on with yourself and the Cohen brothers? And Three years, um, Julian and I uh, started it with Pete Cotton and uh, we brought Sean in, we had uh, a bit of a spinal tap problem with bass players for a while but Brian's been with us for two years now, um, doing, because Julian and I come from the same roots, we started off with the intention of doing the little feet, the steely down thing, but was, living around here we've got the Jim Capaldi yeah. connection, uh, local boy. Um, so uh, we've moved from being really driven by the West Coast feel to, to this more English thing now, I think. Um, so most of the covers that we do are fairly different. 
Um, the, the traffic ones were probably a little truer to, uh, but we've just started doing Rock and Roll Stew, which is one of the early ones, and of course it, it suits us as a band because we tend to extemporise quite a bit, we'll go off on tangents, um, and because we've been playing regularly for two or three years, you know, we, we can mess around with that, we can play around on stage, and so long as we know where we're coming back in, as long as we've got a cue to come back in, you know, we can go off on our flights. So a lot of what we choose... It, are songs that will enable us to do that. So Mr. Fantasy, you know, there's a structure to it, but you, depending on how Sean's feeling and, and what Julian wants to do, we can play around within the structure of Mr. Fantasy and we know how it's going to end. And that sort of suits And you do a lot of men. I like the, the, team, the team feel of playing in a band where you know, we're all looking around and, and when, when you're all working together, when a band is, is more than the sum of its parts, you know, something's working. So it, it's a bit like alchemy really, yeah. sometimes you're never quite sure why it's happening. But it, there's nothing better than when something's really working and you're really at the top of your game and you can look around and the bass player's smiling and you're all catching each other's little signs. And Julian is a great one, flappy hand signals, you know, bang, slow down and stop here, go around again. And it's, it, that, that's great fun. The only music festival uh, I ever go to is Cropperty. I go every year, have done for about five years. And this year we played at the Cropperty Fringe in the, the, the back, uh, back of the Brazenose Arms. Um, and it's the, the biggest crowd we've played to. Uh, they had a stage up there and uh, it, it was just, it was a lovely summer's afternoon. It had been a lovely week and um, it, it, everything went perfectly from, from the first note to, to the end. And it, it, it went in the blink of an eye. You know, yeah. Looking back on it, I remember very little of it. But when I was there, I was just conscious of the fact that people were dancing in the garden, in the sunshine, in, in a pub garden. There must have been a thousand people there. We, we went down well, which is so rewarding you know, when you do get a response and people are enjoying it. Uh, which is you know, it's why you do it, really, isn't it? There's no point playing to people that are just going to stand there and look at you or aren't enjoying it. So when a gig works well, which it did, um, it, it was just yeah, sublime really and I said as we came off I said to Julian if I never play another gig yeah, I'll, I'll always remember that one right. it, was, it was the pinnacle it was as good as it's going to get really and what about the future how long do you think you're going to go on with this until you can't <coughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, we're all still enjoying it at the moment. We're just about to record an album of covers because we've, we've done two studio albums, if you like. Um, but we're a very different band live. And this is true of so many bands. I see that a lot. Yeah. Uh, translating some real live energy onto a studio exactly. seems to be what, very difficult. Well, that, that's what we're, we're trying to achieve. So we've got the two studio albums and we've done, we did a live DVD that was um, an amalgam of two or three gigs at the Robin, which is, which is good. But we want to do um, an album of the covers um, in as live a, a, a situation as we can. So we are, we're doing it on Monday. Um, we're going to get as many covers down. We're doing it all set up in the studio, as live as possible, in no intention of doing any overdubs, and just trying to capture that, that moment, really. Um, I remember Slade Alive did it, which right. yeah, I've right. always yeah, remembered album. Slade Alive. Great yeah. album, and I, I think well, Slade Alive was yeah. one of the first ones I remember, first live albums, and they, they had uh, they probably had 20 people yeah. in the studio, so there's a bit of a feel of, a, of the live gig there, and that's what we want to achieve, so that's what we're trying to do. Where it goes from there is difficult to say. We're a band in our 50s, you know, we're, we're not suddenly going to achieve fame and fortune, I don't think we're really looking for that. Um, we've We've gone from doing half hour slots at small pubs to, to doing, you know, m having a circuit where we're playing on the same circuit as sort of Trevor Burton and Steve Gibbons, who are our heroes from the, the, the Birmingham in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, I've got a Steve Gibbons old Tulane. Tulane? Oh, no, it's live, Caught in the Act, I think. Okay, it was. Caught in the yeah. Act, one of the yeah. great live albums. Yeah. We, we, had the, we had the privilege of um, supporting them at the Robin 2 earlier this year. Uh, absolutely one of our heroes. Um, so we're on that sort of circuit, we're enjoying what we're doing there. I don't know what the possibilities are of going any further than that, to be honest. But as far as that goes, that's great. One of the great joys is playing a small pub we do, the Prince of Wales in Ledbury, on a Sunday afternoon. We do the Prince of Wales in Birmingham at the back of the, the uh, NIA. We do that on a Sunday afternoon. A small pub full, absolutely full of people that have come to listen to music and enjoy music. Uh, we play for three hours. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. And to be honest, it probably won't get any better than that. <laughs> well, that's about as good as we can expect. And